Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for participating in, in the 2021 Deb course, school and learn. Uh, and in this video, I will um, try to go beyond the standard Deb model and talk uh, with you about uh, uh, cases where we need to use uh, uh, multivariate Deb models. Okay. Let's start by uh, posing the situation. So in the, in the standard Deb model, usually, we have a model where we have one reserve, one structure, one maturity, one reproduction buffer, and the organism usually uh, feeds on one substrate. But there are situations where uh, you might want to model, model something that uh, needs more than just one uh, state variable of each type. And so we will, in this video, uh, think about these cases and how do we go uh, from the standard Deb model to a more complex model uh, within the framework of Deb theory. So we will think about the cases where we might need multiple substrates, multiple reserves, multiple structures, and also uh, multiple products, the, the, the uh, possibility of producing multiple products. Uh, this is uh, just uh, a slide to give you an idea, uh, a summary of the standard Deb model. So here uh, you have uh, the uh, scheme, uh, uh, the summary scheme of the Deb model, where you have uh, food being uh, transformed into reserve and uh, some products being uh, produced in this transformation, main, uh, mainly feces. And then the reserve is being mobilized. Uh, we have the Kappa rule to divide this mobilized flux. Uh, a, 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 a part kappa goes into the somatic branch and is used to pay somatic maintenance of the existing structure and to grow uh, more structure. And one minus kappa goes into the maturity and reproduction branch, uh, also a part of it for maintenance and the other either to increase maturity or to uh, be stored in the reproduction buffer. So the different cases are in the different life stages. Uh, in the embryo life stage, uh, you don't have uh, the incoming uh, assimilation flex. And uh, uh, the, the flex PR is being used to increase maturity. Uh, when we reach the maturity threshold of birth, then we start, uh, the organism starts to assimilate. And then when uh, the organism reaches uh, the maturity threshold of puberty, uh, the, the flex PR that was being used to increase maturity now starts to be put aside in the reproduction buffer for, uh, uh, for the, the use to, to, to make eggs for reproduction, okay? This, uh, this equation summarizes the model, and it is usually called what is called an hybrid dynamical system. Um, this is just to, um, to see where we start from, the standard Deb model. And now, when we want to go further beyond this model, we have to think uh, about several modeling criteria to keep in mind. It's very important to, to keep this in mind. Uh, when, so one of the most basic um, uh, criteria, uh, criterion to keep in mind is the, the uh, criterion of consistency, to make sure that the dimensions of the uh, things we are using are correct, that the conservation laws are uh, fulfilled, that there is realism in terms of consistency with data. Then there is the um, 
importance criterion of uh, coherence. So if the model that we are uh, building is coherent with other uh, uh, levels of organization, other fields of interest like chemistry or other fields, um, then efficiency, in very important one also, do uh, uh, efficiency in terms of uh, we shouldn't create a model that is uh, too complex for this for the purpose that we want to use it for. So uh, when we build a model, we should think: Do we need, do I need all these variables? Do I need all these parameters? Uh, could I build a simpler model that still gives me uh, a, a good prediction for what I need? And last uh, but not least important is the criterion of testability. So when I build the, the model, uh, can I then uh, test the model? Do, I, do is there data that makes me uh, uh, that makes this possibility come through? Okay. Keeping all these uh, criteria in mind. Uh, let's think uh, of uh, the specific case of uh, a dev model. So here uh, I have a scheme of uh, a simplified scheme of a dev model. So uh, only with the, uh, 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 the state variable, the food state variable is being transformed and assimilated into the reserve. And then what is mo being mobilized, part of it is being dissipated and another part of the flux is being used for growth of the structure. Okay. This is just a simpli uh, simplified way of presenting the scheme. So when we need to add state variables, remember to ask this question. So uh, the model that I build, does it comply with the dev core? So is it coherent? With the dev uh, with the dev theory, uh, and and to be more specific for this, um, uh, ask the other question: In what situation or situations do I recover the standard dev model? This is uh, always a good test. Uh, so, when does my more complex model uh, become the standard dev model? In which situations? And, that, and do these situations make sense? So a good thing to keep in mind. Uh, so to give you an idea outside of that, I, I, I chose an, an idea, an idea uh, from physics to, uh, to make an analogy here. So in physics, in thermodynamics specifically, for an ideal gas, we have a, a simple equation that connects pressure, um, uh, pressure, volume, and temperature, if we know the number of uh, molecules in a container, this number n, okay? And this is a model that is uh, used quite often and, and works very well. But in some situations, it is not accurate enough. Because in this model, we assume that the particles don't have a volume, they are point-like, and we assume that there is no interaction between the particles. They are just uh, going around and bumping into the walls, but there is no interaction between them. So we can build a more uh, specific model where we uh, introduce interaction between particles and uh, a volume for each particle. In this case, we, we have this model where uh, the new parameter A uh, it accounts for the interaction between the particles and the new parameter B accounts for the volume that the particles now have. So now you see that we have two modules and one way to test the coherence is to think when does my more complex model become the simpler model? And so and you can easily see that if my parameters B uh, and A go to zero, I recover the other model. And that is what makes sense. So if B goes to zero, that there is 
the particles have no volume, they are point-like. And A goes to zero, meaning that there is no interaction between the particles, you recover the ideal model of the gas. Um, so this is just an example. So uh, uh, let's keep this in mind also when we are thinking about their models. Uh, another uh, third question that is also important to keep in mind is uh, asking when you are building a model is that if this model has the least amount of uh, state variables needed to, um, uh, to model the feature of behavior that I want. Okay. Because it is important to keep in mind that for uh, the more um, uh, uh, state variables I add, more parameters I will have to add also. So the, uh, it, it becomes more difficult to uh, parameterize the model, for example, and uh, at some point, uh, and and you might not even have enough data to parameterize that model. So, so uh, the the parameters uh, you have them, but you have no idea what uh, what, what values they should take, for example. Uh, and so, even. Uh, what is usual is that if you have a more complex model, you usually can um, fit the data more easily into your uh, uh, for for your specific case. But still, um, at the the parameters might uh, lose their meaning. So you want to have a, a model that uh, that is an equilibrium between uh, having enough to model your feature, but it is strict enough to not model everything uh, uh, by just choosing random parameters. Okay? So try to use the minimum amount of state variables, and that, uh, in, in, uh, that implies also a minimum amount of parameters uh, in your model. Okay, so let's start with multiple substrates. So uh, I'm focusing now on this part of, of our scheme. Uh, to uh, re remember, uh, in the standard M model, we usually have one substrate that is transformed into the, uh, to the product that is the reserve of the organism. So in this case, uh, we can model the, the organism as an uh, SU, a synthesizing unit. And so uh, if um, a particle of food goes into the SU or the other way around, so if the SU goes uh, to find a particle of food, so yeah, that's the same thing, we can have two uh, different possibilities. First, either the SU or the organism is free to take up uh, the particle of food. And in, the, in this case, it will process it and will transform it into the product that in this case will be the reserve. Or the, uh, the uh, SU or the organism is occupied, uh, 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 sorry, back uh, here in this case, we call this uh, state of the SU, the binding state. So it's open to bind a particle of food. But uh, the other case is that the, the SU or the organism is occupied with some food. And so in this case, it will not be able to, to process the, the food or to bind the food. So we call this uh, state the processing state. It is processing the food that it already has. Okay. So, and uh, we can compute what is the uh, flex of processed uh, product, or in this case, it's, uh, it's equivalent to the simulated flex for, um, for a food X. So, the more X uh, we have available, the incoming flex of X increases linearly, but the assimilated flex. Um, 
uh, increases to a uh, to a maximum amount of a simulation. Uh, that is uh, the, the maximum is regulated by the processing time of uh, the SG. Um, so this is the simple case that uh, we also have seen it in the, the DevEx MOOC. Uh, but now uh, let's think of an example where an organism might need more than one substrate to produce the the product that is the reserve. So in this case, it is a complementary uh, uh, case where uh, the organism needs both X1 and X2 to produce the reserve. And in this case, uh, we can uh, uh, also, using the SU techniques, uh, calculate what will be the assimilated flux given the availability of X1 and X2. So there is a state where the SU is free to bind uh, X1. Then it, it can bind X1. And then uh, there is a, in a state where it can bind X2. Then by binding X2, it has the two substrates needed. And then it can produce the product P. So uh, with this type of scheme, uh, we can uh, uh, write the dynamic equations of the probability of the SU being in uh, each of these three states. Um, and again, going through the scheme one more time, the, the variation of uh, the probability of being in the first two states will be proportional to X1. So the more X1 uh, I will have the more uh, the, the SU will pass from uh, the free state to this second state. The same thing will happen or similar thing between the, these two, the, the two states below. And then uh, we have the production of uh, the product with, um, uh, uh, with a, a production rate uh, k, k dot. Uh, by assuming that the, the SU is in a steady state, so that the variation of probability between the, truth, the, the three states is constant, uh, these equations uh, become, uh, uh, we say that there is no variation, so they are equal to zero. And so we get these three equations. But in reality, these uh, three equations are just two. Uh, you can check this by if you summing if you sum these two equations, you get this this one equation. So this the 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 one of the three equations is not independent. So we have to get rid of this one uh, of of uh, one of the equations, and we have to replace it by another because we want to compute the states. Uh, we have three. Um, uh, three unknowns, that is the, the state, um, the proportion of time in, in a given state. And so uh, knowing that uh, the SU must be in one of the three states, so the probability of being uh, in one of them uh, uh, sums up to one, okay? And so we, now we have the three equations that we need to compute uh, what is uh, uh, the the time that is spent in this um, in this state, and with this we can compute what is the produced flux for this case. This case is is called a sequential complementary case because complementary, as I said before, because we need both x one and x two to produce the product, and sequential because. Uh, uh, we need first to bind X1 and then to bind X2. Okay. Uh, this could not be the case. Uh, and we could have, for example, the case of a parallel complementary. So in this case, the SU could bind X1 or X2 and then bind the other one that it needs to produce the product P. Uh, 
so uh, we have basically four types of uh, these uh, uh, SUs that is complementary, as I as I first talked about, sequential complementary, parallel complementary, but we can also think of a case where the, the substrates are substitutable. So uh, the organism can either um, eat X1 or X2 and it will produce the reserve, for example, or uh, uh, we have substitutable sequential or substitution, substitutable parallel uh, examples. So just with two substrates, we have uh, these, uh, uh, at least these four types of, uh, um, of SUs. Um, so this could be used uh, for uh, uh, organisms, that, for example, that have different diets in different um, phases, or for example, organisms that need to, to eat um, nutrients or to get nutrients from eating different types of foods, for example, and then that will the, they will use the different types of foods to complement each other uh, to produce the, res the reserve, or in the ca uh, cases of inhibition also. So there are several examples where this tool might be interesting to use. Uh, just to underline, the, to not forget uh, to check the limiting cases. That, that means uh, when you are computing, uh, um, one of these um, cases, uh, there is an easy way to uh, to see, to check for, uh, uh, if you made uh, some error in computing the, the production flux. For example, what would happen in a complementary sequential case if there was no uh, substrate B available in this case? So what would happen, what would, expect to happen is that it will not produce the product C because in the complementary case, the organism needs A and B to produce C. So when, one way to check this is if you put the amount of B to zero, do we get zero production? If so, then it passes this check. If in another case, in the case of substitutable substrate, if in this case you have a zero of B, you still produce um, uh, uh, the product because you can produce the product just by using the substrate A. And so in this limiting case, if you put B to zero, you should get uh, the result for the one substrate, uh, one product SU. Okay. So uh, keep in mind to do these coherence checks between uh, when you get these results. So this is an idea to, to use uh, in the case that you need to use multiple substrates. Let's now think about going for multiple reserves. Um, so there are organisms that assimilate different uh, nutrients using different paths. Uh, usually, um, uh, so for example, if you think of um, a microalgae, as an example, it will assimilate nitrogen from uh, uh, with a, a certain path, and it will assimilate uh, carbon using photosynthesis. So they are basically disconnected paths. And so it has the possibility of assimilating one of them when the other is not available. Uh, we, for example, mammals and uh, birds and uh, reptiles, usually we, when we eat, we already eat uh, things that have um, compositions that have the different nutrients that we want. So we uh, usually, uh, uh, we can be modeled with just uh, one reserve. But let's uh, take a uh, let's think now uh, about the, um, an example where we need multiple reserves. So let's start uh, from the, um, the scheme, the simple scheme that I have uh, here uh, for uh, an example of one, one substrate, one reserve, uh, and 
the fluxes, uh, the dissipation flux here, and the growth flux is being used to produce structure. This is the standard depth model as we uh, have been talking uh, so far. So suppose now that instead of having one substrate, we have two substrates, and but the second sub substrate is um, uh, taken uh, to a different reserve, and this different reserve is then used to then uh, produce the structure. So the structure needs both reserves, E1 and E2, to be uh, built. So what we have here is another example of an SU. So it's a, a, an SU, a complementary uh, 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 parallel SU. So we, uh, you can now compute it and, and see if you get this. Um, and so the, the flex, uh, the structure flex, uh, so this flex that has the composition of structure, um, uh, the, the, the amount of structure flux is dependent on the amount of both these fluxes okay, in, given by this formulation. Okay, so um, this poses some uh, uh, new problems. When we are talking about the standard depth model, uh, we have this, uh, we go from the mobilized flux here, uh, uh, the, the output of the reserve. And then we have a way of computing what amount of uh, reserve flex uh, is going to build new structure and a way of computing what is the amount of structure that is being built. So we have a formula for the mobilized flex, a, f uh, a formula for what is the amount of uh, 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 reserve flex that is being used for uh, growth and uh, how much structure is being built from this flex. With these three equations and knowing that the growth flex is just this specific uh, flex here, uh, we can solve these three equations. We have done it before and this gives us the usual, um, the usual mobilization flex that is dependent on the structure. When we have multiple structures, this cycle is broken and we can no longer uh, compute analytically what is the mobilization flex of the reserves, okay? Uh, this is because the, 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 the um, uh, growth flex is dependent on both these flexes and the uh, and the mobilization flex is dependent on the growth flex. So the three variables are uh, uh, are connected in this way. So although although uh, sorry although we can't uh, complete the cycle and have an, an analytical equation for the mobilization flex, we can do it numerically. So this is solvable numerically, and this is the way we deal. Uh, with uh, uh, models with multiple reserves. So um, now that we uh, have dealt with the SU for growth, there is another important new feature in this type of models. Uh, since uh, to have a growth flex, we need um, a flex that comes from both of the reserves. It means that uh, it's uh, the, the two, uh, the flux that comes from the two reserves, usually they are not in sync. They don't have the exact same proportion that you need for, for growth. So there will be a rejected flux from this SU. Now this uh, poses a question, what do we do with this rejected flux? So what would be more efficient is that if we take the, the rejected flex and put it back again into the reserve, uh, the, the, uh, the reserve was already 
uh, was already transformed from the food. So uh, the organism already uh, used energy uh, to produce the reserve. So it is a good thing that it, it, uh, it doesn't waste the, this rejected flux. It's a good thing if it keeps the, this rejected flux. Uh, but what will, will happen if this is if the case would be just like this? What would happen? Imagine that you have uh, the organism in a setting where you have all the X1 that, that you want, but you have a very little X2. What would happen is that the organism would uh, uptake X1, will start to mobilize X1 to produce uh, a structure, but there is not uh, uh, there is not a lot of um, uh, E two a reserve two to produce structure, so it produces a small amount of structure. So both most of the flux from the reserve E uh, one uh, is being rejected and put back to E one to the reserve one. Okay, so it means that we'll build up. Uh, in, in, and it could build up up to a point where the organism would explode. So it, it, it would have space for, for, for the, the result. So what, we, uh, what uh, we have to do is to um, uh, have a proportion of the rejected flux that goes back to the, the reserve but there must be a proportion of the rejected flux that, that is excreted by the organism. Uh, and so uh, it, it is a waste of the organism, but it's a waste that prevents the infinite buildup of reserve in the organism. And so uh, by having the, this, all these fluxes, now we have uh, our completed model of uh, a multiple reserve uh, organism. To give you an example of the results that you can get from this type of model, uh, here is a case of uh, uh, a microalgae with three types of reserves, one from, for carbon, one for, for nitrogen, and one for phosphorus. So uh, you can see here, um, uh, just uh, uh, an example where you have uh, the organism uh, is limited by carbon. So carbon is the one that is limiting the growth of, of this microalgae. And then uh, we have a change in nitrogen and then this uh, uh, nitrogen becomes the limiting nutrient in this case. Uh, and here you can see the transition from a C-limited case to an unlimited case that you can get from uh, a model like this. Okay. Uh, this is uh, an example where you, uh, you might have to use multiple results. So let's now uh, pass to an example where we might need multiple structures in our model. Uh, usually uh, in, in the standard app model, uh, we assume that uh, the, uh, the organs of the model. So the, the, the organism is isomorph for uh, 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 the standard. Um, and uh, so the, all the organism grows at the same rate. So the, all the organs grow at the same rate. But uh, there are cases that we know that it, this is not the case. And you might have to model this. So in general, uh, it, it, if your problem is not specific to a, 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 a given organ, you don't need to model the different growth of the organs. So it's not, it's not a problem that you have to think about in every case. But it might happen that you might have to uh, model uh, a specific organ. So to give you an example, for, uh, for example, for birds, it's usual uh, that the wings of the birds grow at a faster rate than the organism. So it, it does not keep isomorphic during, during growth between the body and, and the wings. So that's, that might be an example. So suppose that we want to model something like this. 
So again, um, we have here a scheme of the standard dev model. Uh, and now we can add a different structure of the organism that we want to model uh, on its own. So what we, uh, uh, what we would do is that we would generalize the kappa rule. So here we have a kappa rule where one minus kappa of the mobilized flux uh, goes into the maturity and reproduction branch and kappa goes into the somatic branch of, of, of the model. Now, by generalizing it, we create another branch. So now we have another parameter, kappa one. And so and now uh, a fraction kappa kappa one goes into the somatic branch of the structure V1 and kappa one minus kappa one goes into the somatic branch of the structure V2. Okay? So in both of these branches, uh, one has to pay a somatic maintenance for each of the structures, and then there is the flux for growth in a similar way. Uh, this is a, an example of uh, some results that you can get from, from a, a model like this. So uh, I have here the example of a, a lizard, um, scle uh, uh, scle scle sorry, Scaloporus undulatus. Uh, and here, uh, the organism, uh, I have here uh, the graphs of the uh, growth of the body and the tail of the organism. So suppose now that uh, this type of, um, of lizard, or there are several lizards in fact, that if they lose the tail uh, as a, um, uh, a mechanism to, to uh, uh, to ex escape from predators, um, they can regrow a, sec uh, regrow a second tail. So suppose that that's what happens. Uh, we can then model it, uh, the, the tail as a different uh, structure. And we can uh, say, now suppose that we uh, uh, the, the organism uh, 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 does not have a tail at some point. And then what will, happen, what will be the dynamics of the regrowth of the tail? So if you use this, uh, one type, uh, this type of model that uh, we've been talking, you can do the dynamics of this type of example. So you see here, there is an impact in the, a small impact in the structural body, the growth of the, of the body of the organism. And you, here you have the, the total mass of the two. Um, and then at some point, it will become again indistinguishable and then you can model it again as just a standard depth model from some point on. Uh, to give you a, a summary of the type of um, uh, uh, models that you can see in the dev book, for example, uh, this, uh, the, the one that I've been talking about is called the static uh, model with multiple structures. But you can have an example of uh, a dynamic model where the, the new kappa, the kappa one that I introduced here, is not static throughout the, the dynamics, but it changes. And it might be, for example, if you have um, structures for uptake, different stru structures for uptake that will be rewarded with growth, for example, if they are used more. So suppose that you have an uptake, uh, 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 something that uptakes a, a type of food that is more available, and then the organism grows more that uptake structure because it is more available and so gets more food from it, for example. Uh, and then you have a more complex uh, example with multiple structures where you not only have multiple structures, you also have multiple reserves. And that is what I would call a multiple modules uh, model. And that's what I will talk about next uh, in the next section. So a plant is a, a more complex model, uh, specifically uh, if you look at the tree, for example. 
uh, to model a tree, uh, it's, uh, it's important to think of um, the root and the shoot uh, more or less as like two different organisms that are exchanging energy between the, between, uh, the two. Uh, so uh, the, the root has the ability of uptaking nutrients like nitrogen, for example, and the shoot has the ability of uptaking carbon using light and photosynthesis. Okay? So they have their own dynamics and then they have a translocation uh, between, uh, between the two, the translocation of reserves between the two. Uh, this is more or less what I uh, would uh, draw as a scheme between the two. So you have an uptake for one module of the of the organism into the reserves that can be used into uh, the structure. For example, here the, the structure of the shoot of the tree, and in this module you have the same uh, a similar thing, a symmetric thing for the root. But then the root can uh, give uh, reserves. Uh, to the shoot and the other way around, they exchange it. And so you can have the dynamics between these two. And for example, if you cut uh, a tree, there are some trees that use uh, the reserves of the root to build a new shoot, for example. So they can uh, have, uh, you can model this type of dynamics. Um, so you see, you have uh, many types of building blocks uh, inside the DEB framework that you can use to um, build a more complex model. And so here is a, a generalized model. Um, uh, but um, I, I always like to stress, don't get too um, eager to complexify your model, always keep in mind that uh, always keep in mind what is your goal, and what is the minimum uh, amount of state variables uh, or uh, structure of your model that can get you to your goal. So um, don't uh, uh, or and and it is always good also to start simple. See if it works, and if it not, if it does not work, then complexify it a bit and do it by steps. Uh, don't start uh, by building a very complex model and uh, and try to to parameterize it and uh, parameterize it and use it. Okay. Uh, finally, uh, just uh, to uh, also not leave products behind. So. Uh, you, you have seen in the DevX MOOC uh, that the products, so things that are produced by the organisms like uh, um, uh, feathers or nails or um, even uh, CO2 production or other, other types of products, they are uh, always, in the standard DEV model, they are always um, a linear combination of three fluxes, the fluxes that we have here, assimilation, dissipation, and growth. So now, if you have a, a more complex model, the question is, does it make sense to use more fluxes for product formation? So you have more types of uh, growth uh, or assimilation fluxes or dissipation fluxes, so it might make sense in these types of models if you want to model a product uh, to, to, to have that in mind. Thank you for your attention and I wish you all a very nice course and we'll be talking. Thank you all, bye.